Welcome, friends. It is our great pleasure to introduce you to SICOT Pioneer. Pioneer is a program of innovative orthopedic networking, e-learning, education, and research that was designed to fill the gap left by the absence of face-to-face -face meetings, courses, and other activities during the 2020 coronavirus pandemic. But Pioneer has become so much more than this in the intervening year. Pioneer is a virtual, but also very real community of like-minded orthopedists striving to help not only themselves, but one another. With the latest video conferencing and educational technology, as well as a groundbreaking online platform, SICOT's Pioneer events, activities, and resources are reaching every corner of the globe, with over 55,000 views of our webinars so far. We're forging new partnerships, signing agreements with 12 other international academic societies, and building an enduring network we hope will last for many years to come. So, what can you expect from us? Free webinars led by key opinion leaders from around the world and across all fields of orthopedic surgery and traumatology, as well as chat shows with some of the most interesting and inspiring surgeons on the planet. Opportunities to take an interactive role in these webinars by participating in polls and live discussions. Free on-demand Pioneer playback service. Watch our webinars again and again in your own time. And coming soon, our new bespoke learning management system will host podcasts, an online version of the famous SICOT diploma exam, virtual training modules, surgical technique courses, a discussion forum, and much, much more. We hope you'll join us on this pioneering journey as we push the boundaries of what is possible in online orthopedic education together. Okay, uh, now I think we will start. Uh, I may introduce uh, my dear professor, uh, Dr. Perle Gutas. He will uh, speak about the uh, free medial femoral condyle club. Uh, please go ahead, my dear professor. Thank you, Ahmad. I think uh, I sent a video that uh, the video can start. Otherwise, I do that live. Hello, dear colleague. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here with you now. And uh, I send you my recorded talk because uh, I'm not sure that it works uh, when we are in, uh, in, in our meeting in a few minutes. So I have to really, really to thank Hamad Adoski for this kind invitation. And uh, my, my talk is about uh, medial femoral condyle and uh, uh, his harvesting. So all we know that uh, the flap is based on the descending genicular artery and was described for the first time in 89 uh, from Maskele and in 91, the first time has a free vascularized graft. The pedicle is six to 13 centimeter and uh, the pedicle diameter is uh, 1.53 millimeters. This is the first description done by Doy in 91, and this is the anatomy. We can base the flap on two main arteries, the longitudinal branch to keep a cortical periosteal flap or the transfer branch to keep some part of the cartilage of the knee. Uh, all we know that we have no creepy substitution for the uh, vascularized bone graft uh, is a live tissue and can be used in poor quality bed. Now I, I talk about indication. This, as I show you, is the anatomy and uh, is a constant anatomy every time different one patient to another. We have three different ways to harvest our flap, corticoperiosteal flap, corticocanchelous flap done by a block, of bone or 
with a part of the cartilage osteochondral flap. The corticoperiosteal flap is useful as a sleeve in bone non-unions. The block is useful for scaphoid non-unions, big loss in small bone, and the osteochondral flap is useful to reconstruct scaphoid and lunate in difficult uh, necrosis or um, problem of the lunate. So these are the three main indications, non-unions of long bone, uh, non-unions of small bone with big loss of substance, and uh, osteochondral graft for scaphoid and lunate. And this is the surgical technique, uh, has um, the, the technique is always the same to arrive to the medial and femoral condyle. Uh, the first incision is uh, in the middle part of the knee. We look for the adductor manus, then we retract the adductor on the femur, and immediately uh, over the adductor, there is our vessel that is the descending genicular artery. It's very um, common to find the vessel in that position. Then we discover the medial side of the knee and we can harvest a piece of uh, uh, periosteal flap and a little bit of bone or to go in the knee, in the trochlea, we will see after. So we understand where is the vessel, then we go to keep the periosteal flap. We elevate the flap with some scalpel and uh, it's very important to keep intact the longitudinal branch of the vessels that goes in continuity with uh, our main vessel. These are the two possibilities to harvest the flap, corticoperiosteal and osteochondral flap. This is at the end of the harvesting. The flap is, uh, can be three, four centimeter per three centimeter, can be a little bit uh, bigger than this one you see in my pictures. And uh, at the end, uh, we have a piece of bone that can be also cut to, uh, has been put around the uh, non-unions as you see here, or as you see here, around a plate. Normally we do not remove the plate and we uh, put around, we wrap around the non-unions with this flap. This is a, um, a case, you see non-union, we don't move the plates and we add a little bit of biology to our bone. And this is another case, we can use that also for substitute some bone disappearing. This is the fifth metacarpal, and uh, we use that to wrap uh, the tendons and create new bone. Corticoperiosteal block is the same technique, but we need to, be, to keep more of bone, and this is very useful for the scaphoid non-unions, like in this case. And the last way to keep our uh, cortico periosteal with the cartilage is uh, in this way. I show you all the technique. This is the medial trochlear flap as described by Ingis and Burger. This is uh, the way to do. It's very nice paper to study. This is the surgical technique. Uh, this is the patient uh, proximal pole necrosis. Uh, this is very young. Uh, is not frequent procedure. We remove the proximal part of the scaphoid. We, we keep with a vac. Uh, we do the same shape we need. Then we go to the knee. We take the corticoperiosteal flap with the cartilage and then the vessels. Then we bring our osteochondral graft with us and uh, we turn around. We use always uh, a very kind so uh, that that uh, help us to do this very difficult surgery. This is at the end with a screw, and this we are one month, two months, three months, and a very nice healing in this patient. This is at the end, and this is uh, the knee. The 
suture in this case of the vessels is done with the radial artery and the committant vein. This is the same indication, the, the same harvesting with a different indication. This is for the lunate, same technique, harvesting with the cartilage and then the blocks is positioned in the patient. And we have few cases of that, but very, very good results. In all these patients, we do not have problems to the site of harvesting, and it's a technique that is really very, very sure. Very difficult, but very sure. I invite you all to the next meeting of the European Federation of Microsurgery in Milan, 9 to 11 May next year. You are welcome and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Reedy, for this elegant presentation. I have one question. When we use it as an osteochondral graft for the uh, reconstruction of the proximal tool, the scaphoid, the, 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 the bone is not covered by, from all sides by the cartilage. So maybe some part of which articulating with the, with the cavitate, maybe only cancellous bone. Is there any problem with that for the long standing, maybe osteophysis, yeah. something like that? You are right. Uh, normally, we try to keep uh, the bone between scaphoid and uh, um, capitate. So these ligaments are very important. And if we can save the, uh, the amount of bone that exists from the natural scaphoid to the capitate is much better. If this cannot be achieved, yes, we have cancellous bone against cartilage and we try to put in the middle a little piece of some tissue tendon something that uh, cannot uh, uh, provoke arthritis in that uh, we do not have at the moment problem in that side but you are perfectly right thank you <laughs> professor Toast. yeah i have a question thank you very much for your great presentation so uh, regarding the uh, treatment of lunar ischemia, you harvest this, the, the condor. So how to shape? Because this, the lunar is the many cartilage. And uh, do you use the dorsal approach or the water approach? And the second question is about the petticoat and how to preserve the cartilage as well as the, uh, the, the petticoat of the blood. Vessels. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, the harvesting is very, very difficult. Normally we do a 3D printing pre-op of the lunate and we go on the knee uh, with this with this shape that we know it exactly what we need for the wrist. The access is dorsal. And we do all that by dorsal side. And uh, we, we put only two Kishner Y to keep that. And the only indication is when the lunate is normal uh, with the capitate. On this uh, joint should be normal and the other part should be uh, not good. For the second uh, question, we, we do a terminal lateral uh, arteriography with the radial artery in the snuff box. So always the same technique, very, this is the easiest part of the operation. It's very, very tricky. Yeah. But at the end, yeah. the company yeah. is so yeah. high that uh, we, we really do not know why, but every time we have very nice results on pain. Not, not really on the movement, but on of pain and savage of joint. is very nice. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Todd. Uh, now we have to move to the next speaker. We have a, a very tight uh, time limit. Uh, I may introduce Professor Zhu. He will speak about the concealed perforator flap. Please uh broadcast the, the video and before the uh, broadcast i would like to introduce a little bit about the console uh, fracture console perforator okay
Okay, go ahead. Okay, th- thank you, thank you very much for the uh, dossier to invite us. And because when we harvest the uh, uh, ALT flap, and sometimes we may not find the uh, obvious perforators, it may have to abandon to use this uh, flap. However, if we use the uh, console uh, flap, console of perforator, that means there's a uh, capillary vessels to harvest it. So um, the last video will presented by my colleagues and uh, Dr. Uh, Jian Qi, Dr. Qi will introduce about the concept and the animal study as well as the clinical application of use as a uh, concealed perforator flat. Please play the video. Hello, everyone. I am Qi Jian from China. The first affiliated hospital of Sun san University. In this section, I want to talk about concealed perforate fly. Includes conception, animal experiments, and clinical practice. In the past 30 years, the perforate fly as the biggest advancement be accepted. The basic the point is a vessel caliber larger than 0.5 millimeter. But in clinical practice, we noticed another type of vessel should can be potential blood supply source, perforate branch less than 0.3 millimeter. We can name these vessels as the concealed perforate. We may worry about if enough blood can be supplied by this concealed perforate. So we designed flap with a male limer. From this picture, we can see many capillary in male limer to skin passing through fascia. So for the test, the feasibility of a new concepts and methods, we design this uh, animal experiment. Here, we looked at the traditional profit under microscope. At last, we found the concealed perforate flap with myelimer can improve the wearable area of the flap. Before clinical appointment, we try this uh, flap design on corpse. Next is the two cases. The case one is a hand skin defect. We design a bilobate flap with only one traditional perforate branch. So we perform this new method to produce the blood of the flap distal part. From this case, initial success was achieved. The case two is a tumor dissected defect in left limb. During the operation, operation, we designed a traditional perforate flap and a concealed perforate flap at the same time. We blocked two big perforate branch for 30 minutes. The good bleeding on flap still can be found. <laughs> So we cut off the traditional muscular cutaneous the perforate branch that can make the operation time shorter.
Here, we can see no bigger perforate branch existed. It's partially by light transmission experiments. Then one artery and one wing were anastomosis. Uh, anyway, the flap survived. Here is a flap wheel the four years after surgery. At last, we can draw this primary conclusion. The concealed perforated flap with male limer can provide a new option for reconstruction of a soft tissue defects as backup solution, and that enriched the theoretical understanding of the flap blood supply. However, this new concept deserved further experimental and clinical investigations to determine its safety, efficiency, and reliability. Thanks for your listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zhu, for this very nice presentation. Uh, I have one question. Can this new concept apply to, to any flag? Mm, actually, it depends. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question. It depends on the anatomy because there's uh, a lot. Every uh, flag can have the septum. Just, this is a uh, mm, very unique, just in case of we cannot find the perforator. We cannot find the perforator, but they have the uh, septum arrived right from the source of the perforate, a uh, source of the uh, major vessel to the flap. So we can just harvest with a uh, very thin uh, uh, septum to as the uh, brush supply source. So, so, so you have to look for every case. You take a look and then if you can find this uh, concealed perforator, you can go ahead. If you cannot find a good perforator. Um, usually the first uh, option uh, is to find a perforator. If there's a low perforator, they can just uh, as a, a backup, as a backup the resource to, to solve it. Or if there's a uh, the, the second case, and the doctor just show is uh, even they have a perforator, but if it's uh, take two more time to dissect the perforator, and we can find the symptoms, we just make it an easy way to just harvest this uh, with the symptom as the uh, you know, the council we call the council uh, perforator. Actually, it's some uh, similar to the capillary capillary perforators. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the panel? Thank you very much, Dr. Zhu. Now we move to the next speaker. Okay, thank Dr. you. Dr. Yes. We'll uh, speak about the uh, middle arm flap. Please, uh, Dr. Farias, go ahead. Hi, do you hear me now? Uh, my name is Efraim Farias, and I would like to thank Professor Adosoki for this kind invitation. And in the following meeting, we'll talk on lateral arm free flap. Uh, I work in Mexico City in the hand surgery department of the National Institute for Rehabilitation. And as a background, the lateral arm flap was initially described as the upper arm free flap by Song in 1982 as a possibility for soft tissue coverage. Kleiner and Kutz were the first to use it for free coverage in the hand. And in 1984, Ackland, Schusterman, and Katzaros described its use as an osteocutaneous flap from the distal humerus. More modifications have been described since then. In 1987, a case series of 29 ipsilateral free lateral flat arm flaps used for hand defects by Shaker, Kleinert, and Hanel was published. And since then, the flap has proven its usefulness for the treatment of soft tissue defects in the upper extremities. And an updated chapter by the same authors in 2018 is available. 
the advantages of the lateral arm free flap are that requires one surgical procedure only, allows elevation and immediate mobilization as well as early physical therapy, and is related with less post-op edema and stiffness. And lately, the likeness of color and texture with dorsal skin of the hand. The indications of the lateral arm free flap are selective surgeries, exposed hardware, chronic ulcers, electric burns, and previous flap failure. As an emergency flap can be used in open fractures with soft tissue loss. The reference landmarks are the delta insertion proximally and the lateral epinodial distally, and the intermuscular septum works as a central axis to locate the pedicle. The skin island size to allow primary closure can be up to 10 to 14 centimeters long and six centimeters wide. Even more, a larger size of fascia may be harvested if needed. The flap is based on the brachialis profunda that runs along the radial nerve in the spiral group that gives several branches in the middle third of the arm. This anatomical diagram shows the fasciocutaneous perforators of the posterior radial collateral artery the terminal branch of the brachialis profunda that nourishes the flap. This artery provides several periosteal, muscular, and fasciocutaneous branches, and the skin perforators irrigate the arm and the proximal fifth of the forearm. The drainage is by the cephalic vein and brachialis comitans. The pedicle length is up to 8 cm, and the vessel's caliber is 1 to 2 mm. In this paper published in 2019, the authors analyzed several previous papers with the more common complications related to the appearance, including the need of debulking and unsatisfactory cosmesis. Our surgical technique is the same as the previously described as elsewhere. We begin with the skin landmarks and the design of the skin island centering the flap along the septum, and we don't use tourniquet. We always try to start dorsal and distal until we reach the deep fascia. And the dissection is then carried out between the septum and the triceps identifying perforators. And then we can go to the anterior aspect of the arm. The radial nerve should be identified and protected. And following the septum, the pedicle is identified close to the septum insertion in the humerus. As here, we can see the neurovascular pedicle with all the structures identified. The pedicle is then followed as proximal as needed up to eight centimeters long. Finally, the flap is harvested and the donor site ready to closure. Most of the times, primary closure is possible. And here's some clinical cases. The first is about a three-year-old uh, kid who left can and got caught on a meat grinder. He was initially treated on a general hospital. A tourniquet was placed and sent to our institution where an initial IND was performed. The evaluation showed poor vascularity of the index to ring fingers with severe damage to tendons, vessels, nerves, and bones of the three central digits. An initial revision amputation was performed with primary closure using unhealthy tissue with areas with poor vascularity and the skin under tension, as we can see. The patient progressed with a polymicrobial infection and after the debridement, a vacuum assisted closure device was placed. And uh, after infection was controlled, a lateral arm flap was used for coverage using the previously described technique. And the anastomosis is performed in the dorsal vessels close to the anatomical snuff box. And we prefer the use of microscope to perform the anastomosis as we can see in this intraoperative video, the chance of complications is lesser if a good arteriography is performed, as Dr. Toss uh, told us. Clinical results three months later, um, where a three-year-old patient can use his hand with a basic pinch for his daily activities and manipulate objects with both hands. In this case, an 11-year-old may sustain a crush injury diagnosed as a close facial injury. Two weeks later, he developed with a full thickness necrosis of the skin of the dorsum of the hand, measuring 6 per 6 centimeters. An ipsilateral arm free flap was planned for immediate coverage, as we can see in this video. A debridement is carried out until healthy tissue is obtained. And after debridement, the extensor apparatus was found intact. An immediate flap was performed, aiming to obtain 
pliable skin needed for full hand function. And here the immediate pictures of the flap due to dorsal vein impairment, we left a temporary drain to prevent hematoma in this case. The flap provides a nice coverage for tendon gliding and preserves hand full range of motion. As we can see in these clinical pictures and the video recorded four months after the surgery. With this cosmetic appearance of the extremity, and reincorporation to his daily activities. This flap may be also an option for foot coverage as in 13 year old male who sustained a motorcycle accident with a metatarsal open fracture and skid necrosis. A lateral arm free flap was used as well to provide a, a vascularity and coverage to the dorsal aspect of the foot with this clinical flap incorporation and good radiological and clinical bone healing with a scar that can be covered with a t-shirt. The last case shows the versatility of the flap. A 46 year old uh, female who sustained a severe injury of the right hand with a tortillas machine. A very dangerous device that accounts for hundreds of hand injuries in Mexico every year. She was treated initially in a general hospital where IND and primary closure were performed. And three days later, uh, she arrived with this swollen hand, fetid exudate and extreme pain. And the initial findings were a deep infection with a median nerve suture to the flexor pollicis longus and arterial thrombosis in the hand. And after several debridements where much of the anterior forearm muscles had to be excised with positive, positive cultures for polybacterial infection, required recurrent surgical procedures to debride all the infected and non viable tissue showing a slow progression to infection eradication. A cutaneous effect 13% centimeters in size can be seen in the palmar aspect of the wrist, hand, and index to ring fingers. Initially, an anterior uh, interosseous artery flap was planned to cover the defect. We can see here the posterior interosseous pedicle at the wrist, the flap harvest, and its passage to the volar aspect of the hand with no tension. However, the flap was lost due to venous thrombosis and had to be removed. So a lateral uh, arm free flap is well indicated when another flap is lost. Um, we harvested a large flap designed to cover the defect up to the base of the central fingers, as we can see in this picture. Uh, with one large single flap, all the skin defect can be closed using the same extremity as donor site. With this result, the patient currently has no desire of further reconstructive efforts. As a conclusion, we may consider several aspects when choosing a flap. The lateral arm flap is a great option in patients of all ages with soft tissue defects. It's a reliable, reproducible and versatile flap that can be used even when a previous flap fails. This flap has high success rate, over 95%. The surgical time could be less than three hours since it's easy to raise, and the patient may be discharged as soon as the third postoperative days. This flap is a workhorse flap, has a low donor site morbidity, the scar can be concealed with a t-shirt, therefore is very suitable, especially for males. The skin color is similar to the recipient area, and finally, we are sure it's an excellent and practical alternative for reconstruction. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Fariat, for a very, very, very nice presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you one question. What is the maximum diameter that you can harvest with the skin with this flap? With the skin, it's reported that um, uh, we can use up to 14 centimeters long and 7 to 8 centimeters wide. Um, we can take a little bit more, but the closure, the permanent closure would be difficult and we'll have to use a skin graft for uh, coverage of the donor site. Do you have any problems with the feeding vessel, with the perforator, the size of the vessel? No, in actually, case, or your experience? No, actually not. And I like a lot this flap because, uh, as we can remember, the upper extremity in pediatric population, it's very well developed compared with the lower extremity. 
So uh, even in, in small children, and when we are harvesting the flap, the flaps are very reliable and um, it's a very well vascularized area. So I think it's a, it's a very good option and it could be an alternative for hand reconstruction. reconstruction. Um, it's very good because you can use the same arm and the harvesting is very fast. And you can check the other team uh, finding the uh, recipient, recipient vessels. Uh, so everything is it's, uh, very comfortable to do it uh, quickly and reliably. Okay, any questions from the panel or the audience? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Farias, for a very nice presentation. Now we move to the Thanks. next speaker. Uh, my dear Professor Dr. Muhammad Kod will speak about the free latissimus free flab harvest. Please, Dr. Muhammad, go ahead. Good morning, all. Uh, my name is Muhammad Mustafa Kotb. I'm working at Asiut University Hospital. Uh, and it's my pleasure to share uh, our experience with all uh, the eminent names sharing this webinar. I would like to thank uh, Professor Ahmed Dusuki, my dear friend and colleague, and all of you, Professor uh, Tos Luigi, Professor Zhu, Professor Ferias. Uh, you are most welcome and uh, I will uh, share with you my experience regarding the uh, free latissimus dorsi uh, flap. So I'm working at uh, Asyut. Asyut city is 400 kilometers south to uh, Cairo, the capital of Egypt. And uh, we have uh, Asyut University Hospital. Uh, like you can uh, see, is uh, one of the biggest hospital in, in Egypt and uh, serving about 30 million uh, population. Uh, this is the campus of our university hospital, and here is the old building, and this is a new one uh, for trauma, and so we got this building for the trauma center, and this is for the hand and microsurgery, and eventually in the opening ceremony, we'll be delighted to receive all of you uh, here. So uh, took, uh, going back to the latissimus dorsi myocutaneous flap, it's one of the most uh, versatile and useful uh, flaps in reconstructive microsurgery. And I'm sure all of you have practiced this before in your uh, work. It is known for its use in chest wall and post mastectomy. However, if it is used uh, freely, it can be used for coverage of la large soft tissue defects in head and neck and the extremities. Uh, the earliest application of uh, latissimus dorsi was in head and neck and as a medical by Killen in 1978. And uh, the first microvascular free tissue transfer for the lab was described by Watson in 1979. So let's talk about the, versati the versatility of this flab. The latissimus can be transferred as a myofacial flab, myocutaneous flab, composite osteomyocutaneous, including serratus, anterior, and ribs, and also can be used as a mega flap in combination with any of or all of the other flaps based on the subscapular vessels, the subscapular uh, compound flap, including serratus, anterior, scapular, and parascapular flaps. Talking about the advantage of uh, latissimus dorsi myofacial flap, it is uh, a large volume uh, tissue is available for reconstruction. Long vascular pedicle offers excellent range of pedicle flaps. High caliber pedicle makes free flap vascular anastomosis technically more feasible. And uh, possibility of independent skin paddle being able to address complex defects uh, like through and through uh, oral cavity, for example. You can include drip or scapular bone. Uh, this is available also options. Minimal Doran site uh, morbidity occurs and it can be combined, as we have said, uh, with subscapular uh, flaps. 
Uh, so the function of the talking about the function of the latissimus, and this is uh, very important to decide whether to harvest it or to search for another option. Uh, it helps patients in a lot of uh, daily uh, uh, activities, and this is very crucial in patients uh, with hemiplegia or using his hands to move over or using crutches. So uh, you must be careful in choosing this flab in such a uh, group of patients, otherwise you will compromise uh, their motion. Uh, it's very important that the, the action of the latissimus is not dependent on itself on, only. So in the lateral position, like you see, it is also combined with the serratus anterior to provide uh, the stability of the scapula and on the dorsal, plane, you can see it is working on the contralateral uh, gluteus maximus uh, for climbing uh, and uh, other functional exercises uh, can be done by uh, those patients. Let's talk uh, rapidly about the anatomy, so the origin coming from the spinous process of vertebrae uh, T7 to L5, thoracolumbar fascia, iliac crest, inferior three to four ribs, inferior angle of the scapula. All these are the attachment of origin and must be addressed while you are harvesting uh, uh, your flap. The insertion is going to the intertubercular groove of the humerus and the feeding vessel, uh, uh, it has two dependent, uh, independent uh, vascular supplies. The first one is the thoracodorsal branch, which is the terminal branch of the uh, uh, third part of the axillary artery. Uh, 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 from the subscapular artery and also uh, receiving uh, segmental uh, supply from the uh, intercostal uh, arteries. So the intercostal arteries are supplying the most uh, medial and inferior part of the flap. So you must be sure about uh, this and this should be uh, sacrificed while you are uh, using or harvesting it freely and uh, it is not reliable to use the whole length of the muscle because this part of the muscles are not dependent on the thoracodorsal uh, artery. And the nerve is, uh, is supplied by thoracodorsal uh, nerve. And this schematic presentation showing the uh, part of the uh, uh, flab while you can use as a pedicle and how you can uh, disinsert the uh, insertion so you can uh, use it al as a pedicle uh, flab. Uh, Post-operative protocol as uh, all uh, types of the uh, microvascular anastomosis you can monitor this if it is uh, uh, not deep you can uh, monitor through the viability of the flab through the uh, pen prick the temperature the color uh, the trigger of the muscle, and if it is deep, you can use a myofascial flap so you, part of the skin can be harvested, especially on the anterior border of the latissimus, and this is acts like a monitor for the vascularity of the flap. It's very important also to uh, monitor the collection because uh, after harvesting the latissimus, you will have a very big pocket. Uh, it can uh, have a seroma collection and eventually infection. So you got to uh, monitor this using a suction drain. Usually we put two suction drain and we leave it uh, up to uh, uh, 72 hours after uh, the surgery. Uh, regarding the contraindication, of course, if the patient has got uh, radiotherapy, for example, after radical neck dissection, and uh, you will be worried about the vascular, uh, the vascularity and the ability to do anastomosis for such vessels with extreme fibrosis and adhesions. The other uh, uh, contraindication, as we have said, if the patient is handicapped or using his hand in the uh, uh, wheelchair or crutches. So to conclude, the clinical use of latissimus, it is either functional or non-functional. And as a functional, you can use it a pedicle or a free. And if it is non-functional, you can use it as a pedicle or free also. And you can uh, take it as a myofascial, myocutaneous composite or mega flap. So let's talk uh, a, a brief about using it as a free tissue transfer for coverage. For example, this is a nine years old uh, uh, boy. He he was uh, uh, in, endorsed in a road traffic accident. He was uh, riding a trip with his father and mother who eventually died in the accident. And he got this 
uh, he used part of soft tissue uh, defect on the dorsum of the forearm with loss of all the extensor tendons. And uh, this is showing intraoperative photo of the uh, latissimus dorsi after uh, uh, cutting it from the all attachments and only the vascular pterygial, which is intact. And this is after anastomosis to the radial artery and vein for coverage of this huge uh, soft tissue defect. And this is the uh, uh, functional uh, after coverage of uh, split sickness skin graft of uh, succeeded uh, microvascular anastomosis and taking and after reconstruction of the extensor tendons, you can have uh, such uh, a good function after such uh, uh, massive uh, road traffic accidents and tissues. Another example, this is uh, Aldo, uh, 34 years old, with a runover accident. And you can see how much is the soft tissue defect on the dorsum of the distal forearm, wrist, and hand. And do the bone uh, is exposed in the metacarpal bones, the distal radius, and the joint is open. And uh, uh, after the uh, uh and the uh, unlucky patient got a polytrauma uh, event, so he got intercostal tube and head injury, so he cannot withstand uh, a reconstructive microvascular procedure at the first scene. So we make a, a biological uh, uh, coverage by this uh, uh, artificial skin flaps to cover the important structures like bone and periosteum and the tendons until complete healing. And this is the harvest of the latissimus after coverage uh, and anastomosis with radial artery uh, also. And this is after uh, coverage by split sickness skin graft. And also uh, we can see the deficiency of the extension. So we make a tendon transfer, flexor carpi ulnaris, extended by uh, iliotibial band. We split it into four parts for the four fingers. And this is the functional, uh, the final functional outcome after restoring the ability of finger flexion and extension. Another example was composite uh, soft tissue defect on the volar and dorsal aspect of the hand and after the bridement. Uh, this is uh, latissimus because it's, it's very difficult to provide a very big uh, versatile uh, skin flap to cover all this part. So we chosen uh, the latissimus. As you can see, it's very huge for this defect. Uh, but fortunately, part of it uh, have uh, necrosed and this is after the bridement of the necrosed part the soft tissue coverage of the bone are in a good condition so we, so we put a split sickness skin graft and this is the functional outcome after uh, we finalized all the reconstructive procedure for uh, such patient and this is to remind you about the original presentation at the scene of accident and the final outcome he can uh, use it in the activities of daily living uh, with a reasonable uh, and satisfactory result for uh, the patient. Another example to, to have it as a bitical, and uh, this is a scheme to show you the excursion of different uh, muscles around the shoulder. And you can see that this muscle uh, is taking 5.9 uh, uh, degrees for the excursion. So we can use it uh, as a transfer for reconstruction of the uh, shoulder external rotation uh, to use it uh, as an external rotator for uh, obstetric brachial plexus cases. And this is an intraoperative example after dissection of the latissimus and suturing to the infraspinatus tendon. And this is a postoperative cost in abduction external rotation. This is the final outcome for shoulder external and the internal rotation after tendon transfer. If this can be used uh, in adults, yes, but we usually combine it with the theories measure to have a more powerful muscle to make this uh, rotation of such a shoulder. And you get uh, excellent results for such patient by combined latissimus and theories measure transfer for the infraspinates. Another uh, use of uh, the uh, latissimus is to use it for reconstruction of massive repairable uh, rotator cuff tears. And nowadays we shift from the latissimus to the uh, lower trapezius because its fibers uh, runs in a more parallel uh, to infraspinatus than the latissimus. However, 
it bring a very nice result and we usually we uh, make it uh, by uh, iliotibial band to lengthen the harvested muscle and this is intraoperative photos to show you the dissection of the latissimus the suture of the iliotibial band and the final outcome uh, you show you you can have such uh, results so in conclusion, latissimus dorsi is a reliable and versatile and is considered as a workhorse for soft tissue coverage, especially in large, uh, massive soft tissue uh, injuries. It is a, it, it got a reliable pedicle and average size of pedicle for anastomosis. It can be used as a pedicle or for restoration of function in obstetric brachial plexus and massive rotator uh, cuff tears. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Palmer, for a very nice presentation. I, I have one question for you. Um, uh, what is the advantage of the Freelatismus over the other skin flaps for the coverage of the soft tissue effect? Why we use it over other flaps like ALT, like lateral arm flap, and other perforator flaps? We consider latismus for the large defects, uh, massive or complex, like, uh, for example, post-traumatic or post-tumor resection. As we have said from as we have seen from the example I have shown, so it is a, a very big size and uh, it can fill uh, very hollow uh, or big uh, gaps with with combined uh, bone and soft tissue even or skin. Uh, so we consider the use of latissimus only for big defects, not so for small. So for small we can use uh, of course LT. Uh, radial forearm flap or lateral arm like the previous uh, excellent brilliant uh, presentations uh, what about with bearing area I I is it better than three skin flaps or the muscle flap is better which is better do you think yes we got a study uh, making a comparison between using a skin flap for the reconstruction of the heel and the plantar aspect of the foot so uh, the skin flap is uh, gives the patient uh, some sort of uh, instability because the gliding layer of soft of uh, subcutaneous fat gives the patient uh, the sense of insecurity while he is putting his foot on the floor. However, the using latissimus gives much better results regarding uh, this feel of insecurity that uh, brings uh, that brought to the patient if you use the free skin. So for reconstruction of the uh, plantar aspect of the uh, foot and the ankle, uh, we prefer muscle flap, but the dorsum, we prefer uh, skin flap because uh, muscle flap on the dorsum, uh, also this is one of the results of our study, showed uh, contracture and will uh, hinder the ankle into uh, calcaneous, uh, calcaneal uh, deformity. So we prefer it for the plantar aspect of uh, foot and ankle. Can we use it for both coverage and function? Uh, actually, uh, some papers shown that it can be used because the uh, soracodorsal nerve is very good to uh, make it, but it is uh, like a multi uh, uh muscle and the excursion is not so good like, for example, the gracilis. So for restoration of function, we prefer using gracilis muscle because uh, unipinnate and uh, gives a much better uh, excursion. So the functional, the final functional outcome will be better uh, to be used like this. But we use it like a medical, for example, to uh, restore a triceps or to restore a biceps. Uh, so like a medical, it brings also uh, a good results in such cases. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions from the panel or the audience? Okay. <clears throat> and uh, Professor Cope, <clears throat> thank you for your presentation. I have a question uh, about the case uh, use the residential flap to cover the hem. So is it possible to harvest the part of the muscle? Because the, you said it's a parcel necrosis of the muscle and then the it, it will be uh, thin and then with the skin, skin graft. So do you uh, consider to, to just harvest part of the muscles? 
Yes, we, we can use uh, part of the muscle, but actually the patient have a circumferential skin loss over each finger, plus uh, the defect on the palmar and dorsal aspect of the hand. So it was a, a huge uh, defect. So we we used part of the muscle, and even after we use it a part, it it became very huge one like you have seen from the uh, photo uh, and also we make like a artificial or surgical syndactyly and we planned after this uh, splitting of these fingers so we used the, the the half of the muscle in such a case however it, it became very bulky like you have seen unfortunately part of it uh, became necrosed so we got a good result but of course, it, this was a, a part of the muscle, not the whole latissimus, of course. Oh, thank you. A little more questions. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, now we uh, move to the next uh, uh, presentation. Uh, this is my presentation, so please uh, broadcast the video. Dear professors and colleagues, I am delighted to be here with you today. The purpose of my presentation is to showcase the video demonstration of the free vascularized fibular graft harvest technique. I hope that my presentation will provide you with valuable insights into this procedure and its potential applications. The free vascularized fibular graft is a popular bone graft used in microsurgery due to its ease of harvest and minimal harvest site morbidity. It can be harvested as a bone, osteocutaneous, or osteomyocutaneous flap, and the fibula can be osteotomized and shaped to fit the recipient site. The versatility of the free vascularized fibular graft makes it a suitable option for replacing bone defects in various areas of the musculoskeletal system, including the lower limb, pelvis, upper limb, spine, and fossomaxillary regions. Bone defects can result from various causes such as trauma, infection, tumor resection, or congenital deficiency. The free fibular graft relies on the peroneal vessels, which have their origin in the posterior tibial vessels. Additionally, the monitoring skin paddle that receives its blood supply through skin perforators that run behind the fibula and pass through the posterior crural septum. A CT angiogram is not required unless dorsalis pedis artery pulsation is absent or vascular pathology is suspected. Locating perforators using a handheld Doppler is recommended, but not mandatory. Our approach to harvesting a free fibular graft is illustrated in this figure. Firstly, we separate the fibula and skin paddle from the gastrosoleus muscle posteriorly. Then, we proceed anteriorly to separate the fibula from the peroneal muscles, anterior compartment, interosseous membrane, and tibialis posterior muscle. To perform a free fibular flap surgery, the fibula bone is first marked on the skin and divided into three sections, proximal, middle, and distal. An S-shaped incision is made on the skin, and the skin paddle is centered around the junction between the middle and distal thirds, where most of the perforators are located. The procedure starts by incising the posterior aspect of the skin paddle, and the skin and subcutaneous tissue are elevated until the sural nerve is visible. The deep fascia is then incised just anterior to the sural nerve to avoid postoperative neuroma. Next, the posterior aspect of the skin paddle is elevated with deep fascia, and the skin perforators can be seen under the deep fascia.
The perforators are further visualized by separating the gastrosoleus from the posterior crural septum, and at least one perforator is needed to supply the skin paddle. The dissection is continued proximally by separating the soleus from the posterior aspect of the peroneal muscles and fibula, taking care to separate the origin of the soleus from the proximal part of the fibula, which is intimately related to the common peroneal vessels. The proximal part of the fibula is then exposed, the common peroneal nerve is protected, and the fibula is osteotomized using a Geely saw. Before incising the anterior aspect of the skin paddle, the presence of at least one perforator is ensured. Two perforators running through the posterior crural septum to the skin paddle can be seen here. The anterior aspect of the skin paddle is then incised, and the skin and subcutaneous tissue are elevated. The superficial peroneal nerve is identified, and the deep fascia is incised just posterior to that nerve. Using sharp dissection, the deep fascia of the skin paddle is separated from the peroneal muscles, and then the peroneal muscles are grasped and pulled anteriorly. While cutting with the scalpel, it is directed towards the peroneal muscles to allow the skin paddle with its deep fascia to fall back, preventing accidental harm to the perforators. Using a Geely saw, the distal portion of the fibula is exposed and cut. Typically, the osteotomy is performed 10 centimeters proximal to the lateral malleolar tip. However, a recent biomechanical study has suggested leaving the distal 10% of the fibula intact. Bone holders are used to grasp the proximal and distal ends of the fibula, which is then externally rotated. The peroneal muscles are then carefully separated from the fibula using sharp dissection, leaving behind a thin layer of muscle surrounding the bone. Afterwards, the anterior crural septum is cut close to the fibular edge. This is followed by the separation of the anterior compartment muscles and the interosseous membrane from the fibula, again using sharp dissection. The peroneal vessels are exposed at the distal osteotomy site and ligated. The proximal fibular end is retracted, and the peroneal vessels are dissected and separated from the posterior tibial nerve and vessels. The procedure then reverts to the posterior aspect, and the separation of the soleus is completed, and any muscular branches are ligated unless it is planned to harvest it as an osteomusculocutaneous flap. The fibula is then separated from distal to proximal, and the flexor hallucis longus is sharply cut, leaving a small cuff that covers the common peroneal vessels. Next, we focus on the peroneal vessels and separate the artery from the vena comitantes.
It is crucial to perform this step before legating the vessels as it becomes significantly more challenging afterwards. Afterwards, we deflate the tourniquet to verify the vascularity of the graft and skin paddle. The skin perforators are clearly visible and there is free bleeding from the skin edge. Thank you for your attention. So now I'm open to any questions. Very nice. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I'm thank thanking you. the voice over technique that allows the presentation <laughs> to be very good because my accent is not very good. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Ahmad, thank you very much. I would like to ask a question. Please go ahead. The anomalies of the uh, pronial uh, vascular pedicle, uh, do you need to do a CT angiopre to uh, predict if there is anomaly because sometimes one of the anomalies that uh, makes a common uh, pronea tibial trunk as a one vessel feeding the food. So how can you manage this? Uh, no, as long as the, the result of speed artery is... Uh, you must check the, the dorsal space pulsation. If the dorsal space pulsation is, pulsation is absent, in this case, you need to, to do CT angio. The presence of dorsal space pulsation ensures the uh, the uh, the uh, the analysis. Uh, Hello. Hello. C can you hear me? Yes. Just yes. now. Uh, now I'm sorry yes. for the, uh, uh, we check the dorsal speed pulsation. If the dorsal speed pulsation is intact, you do not you do not need to do CT angio. If it is absent in this case, you need to do to do CT angio. The presence of dorsal uh, pulsation, dorsal speed pulsation intact, indicates a, 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 a good anatomy or flexible anatomy of the cumuloperoneal uh, vessels. So you just check the dorsal speed. If it is intact, you don't need to do anything more. Okay, you, you you told us to leave uh, ten percent of the length of the fibula distally. Uh, this goes for yes. or for also for the pediatric group, or it is different uh, percentage. And then uh, both of them, but in pediatric group, you have to do uh, uh, another procedure. You have to do uh, tibio fibular uh, synostosis to avoid progressive deformity of the ankle. Okay. Also, what, how do you deal with the flexor halluses? Because most of those patients will get uh, drop uh, big two or contracture of the, uh, the flexor halluses because in this dissection, uh, nearly you uh, devascularize this muscle. So it will uh, go into contracture. What is your experience? Yes, in most of the cases, uh, in the first cases, we almost have some sort of uh, flexion contracture of the big two. So in the preceding cases, we we aim at uh, um, uh, future the flexor height longus while putting the big two in the maximum dorsal flexion. And uh, upon doing that, we avoid this complication. And also upon the section of the uh, flexor halluses from the common pronial vessels, you, you should be very careful and leave only small calf of muscle around the vessel. You do you do not take too much. You suture it to the interosseous membrane or the posterior coronal septum? Interosseous membrane. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Daske, I have a patient about uh, the 
design of the uh, skin pedal. So which uh, perforator you prefer to use? From the video, it seems in the middle and the lower third of the uh, leg. So would you like to use the more uh, posterior uh, perforators? Because it's uh, much more bigger than the distal one. Uh, you know, most of the skin perforators are located um, at the junction between the middle and the distal third of the fibula. Most of the perforators. So I always lock, I always center the, the skin paddle around the junction between the middle and the distal perforator. And I almost always use, I start from the zero to ensure the presence of the perforator. So uh, if you harvest uh, two or more perforators, it may be uh, difficult to rotate the skin if there's a wound and the bone is in a, in a lot of the same alignment. So that, that means not freely to uh, transfer the flap. So you always yes, harvest um, uh, more, more perforator or just one enough? Uh, no, one perforator is usually enough for the skin battle. But whenever we, we, we don't use to move the skin or to rotate it, uh, two perforator is good. But if I, I want to rotate the skin paddle and move it more, then I sacrifice one of them and leave the bigger one and also cut the uh, cruel septum so it can easily move, move the skin to cover any area. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you all very much. Now um, it's about time we have to close. We have to uh, thank you very much for all of you for your uh, contribution and your presentation. It was a very elegant presentation. Thank you very, very much. And we, have, we, we, we hope to meet uh, very, very, very soon. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all of you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good weekend.